like to now invite our next speaker, Mr. Paul Spencer Sochoneski. Paul is an American French writer, writing, a writing coach, conservationist, and communications advisor to the international NGOs. He's a former communications director at WWF International. He has lived and worked in more than 80 countries, including long stints in Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, and Thailand. He's particularly interested in Asian stories that defy Western Cartesian logic. He writes about love affair between Sultan of, okay, I'll, I'll have to pronounce, skip that, Java, and the mythical mermaid queen. And what he will be talking today is the importance of communication in conservation. So please welcome Mr. Paul on the stage. Good afternoon. How is everybody? It's been a wonderful day, hasn't it? I want to thank Mimi very much for inviting me and for organizing this event. And I hope it's the start of other significant events of this type. <coughs> so I have a lot of questions for you today. And I warn you, I have very few answers. But you probably have the answers. So let's see where we go with this. I'd like to talk about optimism, pessimism, actions. As we heard before, conservation without money is just conversation. And different ways of presenting our argument to people who are outside of this room, for people who don't have the background that we do. We're faced with huge problems. And we read about these problems every day. And I sort of think, and it took me a while to realize this, that we're not talking about science alone. We're talking about a social movement. And if you look at the great social movements in the world, conservation slips in quite easily. Look at the way the world has changed in, let's say, the last 200 years in terms of colonialism, in terms of slavery, women's rights, child labor, civil rights, free speech. Social movements happen because people want change, and I like to think because it's the right thing to do. And we're starting to see that a lot around the world, where the environment has been, in a way, repositioned as eco-justice. And that can take different forms. You know, sometimes I think we're a bunch of lemmings, you know? We all, everyone in this room, me, I live in Switzerland, we have a very comfortable life. We're OK. Uh, yes, there are big problems, and we have small problems in our lives. Basically, we're OK. Are we jumping off the cliff and saying we're OK until we hit the bottom? On one side of the argument, we're doing great, really great. And I've made a checklist of things that we've achieved in recent years. Now let's look at conservation treaties. I have a question for you. How many multinational conservation treaties do you think there are right now? Who says 50? 100? 400? 20 million is too much. <laughs> More than 1,300 1, multinational treaties. And some of them are very good. Some of them are good for talking and setting the agenda. And based on these treaties, there's more than 90,000 national action points. That's huge. That was unimaginable 30 years ago when I started working with WWF. So here's my checklist of good things that are happening. 
treaties. Every country has good environmental laws, protected areas. They've set up bureaucracies with ministers of environment. The NGOs are fabulous. And we saw some of them outside. And it's been said before today, NGOs really deserve our support. And we need to look at ways to increase that support for NGOs. But NGOs themselves need to look at ways that they can be better at communicating what they do. The good. There are some very interesting new developments in conservation. And I'll just spend a minute to look at three of them. Putting the rights of nature in national constitutions is quite prominent now. And you think about it, that national constitutions guarantee the rights of people. Now nature as nature, as mother nature, has the basic rights of the country in, installed in the Constitution. In many countries, most countries, 150 plus, you have a basic human right to a healthy nature. That opens up a whole new realm of I don't want to say civil protest, but let's say civil action, where you could say, look, my water supply is dirty. I have a basic right to clean water. I have a basic right to clean air. I have a basic right to have access to green. That's big. I don't think we're making enough of that now. Lastly, this is a new innovation. It's called juristic personhood. Do you know what that means? Is anybody familiar with that term? Yes. What it means is that a natural feature, a river, a waterfall, a lake, a mountain, a tree, has legal rights the same as an individual. In India, the Yamuna and the Ganga are juristic persons. It's based on the idea that a ship at sea can be a legal person, that a business is a legal person, and that natural features are legal entities. So that means you can sue, in theory, on behalf of a sacred tree, which has happened in other parts of the world. Now you think about that. Who's going to be the advocate for that tree? That's a tricky question. What will the courts say? The courts may throw you out and say you're crazy. But it opens up a door. And there are a lot of doors being opened that we might walk through. In spite of all these good things, every day you look at the newspaper and oh my God, the world is crashing. We're doomed. I don't know about you, but uh, I, I'm bothered by that. Sometimes I feel like we're Sisyphus. You know the story of Sisyphus? He's pushing the rock up the mountain every day and just at the very top, he slips and the rock comes crashing down. In communications and in fundraising and in storytelling, and we're all storytellers, please remember that, storytellers, we need to have a good guy and a bad guy. That's what the locomotive of all stories. What does the bad guy want? Well, this may cause excessive greed, loss of human empathy, and disregard for vital environmental systems. Yes, we got the planet, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. But when we're looking at good guys and bad guys, quite often the bad guys are 
me. So much of the noise out there is aimed at me as a consumer. I'm guilty, I ha own and drive a car, okay? I'm guilty, I, ha I use electricity in my house. I'm guilty, I go to the supermarket and I buy food that's sometimes packaged in plastic. <sighs> it's very skewed so that we can think that by changing my plastic bag to a cotton bag, I'm saving the world. It's not bad. It's not enough. So if the sky is falling, who's to blame? Is it me? Is it you? Well, yes. But we often, so often overlook the big powers of the world. The powers of corporate arrogance, the powers of government inability or unwillingness to enforce regulations. And if you're a fundraiser, you're dealing with compassion fatigue. There are a lot of problems in the world, and not just conservation, and you know very well what they are. How do you position yourself as I'm sorry to say this, how do you position yourself as more important than all the other big problems out there? And it's a hard thing to say, but that's the business that you're in, I'm afraid to say it. You have to position yourself as more worthy of somebody's time, energy, and money. In conservation and in fundraising, you have a choice between the balance between the problem and the solution. Without a problem, there's no need for a solution. You have to find the right balance, and that balance is going to depend on what your work is. But by all means, you will be needing to focus eventually on the solution. Yes, we can, to quote Barack Obama. We can do it, we have done it, we are doing it. We need your help to do something in the future. So, what's the answer? Do we scold, praise, incentivize? Or do we wait for a hero? I won't go into this now, it's my own philosophy of our relationship with nature. But basically, we come from nature. Nature is part of us. We have an innate need for nature. And we have a fear of nature, and that leads to a colonial paternalistic perception of both nature and people who live with nature. So we have three options, and this is the last slide. One is do we hope for a society that loves the earth? And that includes cultural, religious, spiritual, traditional values, like we heard a few minutes ago. And realize that we are one with the earth. Do we want a whole mental change? Do we continue what we do, but do it better? Technology, treaties, meetings, laws, working with business? Or do we get angry? Is this a real revolution where things get nasty? We've been very nice up to now. Some people will argue that we've been too nice. I don't have the answer for this. You have to determine where you fit on that, in these options, and they, maybe we need all three. So, I don't know how this ends. I don't know how we all end, but I hope these ideas spur a discussion and we can talk a little bit about it. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paul. I mean, thank you so much again. He's another dear friend of my father's and has come all the way from Geneva uh, in Switzerland and was part of WWF for several decades, several decades ago. 
but without communication, there is no conversation. And I think you've hit the nail on the head. If I want to get my story told, I better say this story well. And I better say it in such a way that that person has my attention and has also opened his heart to what I'm saying. It's about making my angst his angst. So I think that's the expert that you are at in terms of a communication person through WWF. And I remember Appa being uh, the chairman of the Education Commission. The education and communication is so critical in both ways. What do you see uh, today lacking? Like you've exposed, you've been exposed to so many NGOs over the decades and even today. What do you think is the biggest problem that they face? I don't see one problem, I see many problems. Uh, marketing and specifically fundraising is a technical skill. It's more than standing on the street corner asking for money. One principle is know, what you, know who you are and have a voice. Each of you has an individual voice, each of your organizations has an, an individual voice. That's a strong point for you. You need to know who you're talking to. Who's your audience? Who's the one person? I'm talking to one person right now. This lady up here. What are you, what's going on in your head? Why should you support me? What are your objectives? Do you have kids and you're worried about their future? Do you love animals? What's going on between the two of us? What's our relationship? And you're not talking to millions of people. You're talking to an individual. Everybody has somebody in fundraising. Everybody has, there's some, everybody has somebody to whom they cannot say no. So think about how you present it and who presents it and how you create an intimacy with the donor. And finally, if you study the great direct marketing gurus, you'll see that there are four great motivators for direct marketing. Do you remember what they are, Mimi? Greed. Sign up now and you may win a lottery of two million rupees. Exclusivity. You have been selected as one of five in your community. Fear, are you worried about what's going to happen to so-and-so? Or guilt, if you don't give me $100 now, this tiger is going to die. And it sounds silly, those are motivators that are proven. And as I said, it's a technical skill that we can all learn. Absolutely, and so my plan for, as one of the immediate plans, is to work with the curated NGOs to have an online session with you. I understand that you have a busy travel schedule, but we are definitely going to be planning online uh, you know, training sessions because this is so critical that it's not about what I say, it's about what you want to hear and how do I touch that heart. And I tell my team that because I run two businesses, a financial advisory business and a yoga school. And let me tell you, in the financial advisory business also, I'm going out and asking for money. And I'm asking for all of it and saying, I'll take care of it. See, that's another way of asking for money, right? So I do understand this space. And so that is definitely a conversation that we will have later. Let me take some questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Paul, for those uh, very philosophical <laughs> uh, musings in your presentation. You know, um, communication, at the end of the day, communication uh, should be factual and communication should be honest. And one thing that uh, worries many of us is that um, when it comes to conservation narratives, a lot of the conservation narrative is plain fake, fake, fake news. I mean, the last point, you know, uh, that you mentioned, if you don't give me hundred dollars, you know, this particular tiger is going to die. I can give you any number of examples that, you know, People give fake, fake narratives to get, to get funding. I leave the funding side aside, the part, that part aside. But uh, how do you tackle fake narratives in conservation? 
you know, things that are not scientific, things that are unscientific, things that are very obviously biased, but people don't recognize it as biased. And uh, people go on repeating, uh, you know, falsehoods that eventually become like that's the truth uh, as to what's happening, you know. So how, how do you really co counter that with more effective co communication? You know, I agree that we need accuracy and science and facts. And if you look at communication as a spectrum, whether it's written communication or speaking to people, on the one side you have what I call cold communication, which is facts, statistics, science, good spelling, grammar, Wikipedia, and you need that. But there's no intimacy there. There's no connection with the audience. On the other side, you have hot communication, which is intimacy. And that's when you talk to somebody and say, yeah, this is going on. But you're talking about stories. You're telling the story of people working in the field. You're telling the story about what you're doing with animal rescue. You're telling emotional stories and you're looking them in the eye and you're creating an intimacy. You're, if you're in person, you're touching them, you're laughing, they're crying, whatever. And you need a balance between the two. You must have your science, you must have your accuracy. Don't bluff, you'll be caught out and you won't feel good in the morning. But you can combine that science, and that's a skill, with compassion. Thank you, because you know, you've brought about very, very important issues in terms of fake narratives, in terms of even glitz selling, right? It's the, it's the glitz and the glamour that sells. At the same time, this is a serious issue. And how do we bring about a balance in being able to communicate this in such a way that it sensitizes and makes more people understand this, this uh, very important issue? And I can tell you, this is my first endeavor. This is Sinasi's first endeavor to try and bring all of this together and in terms of bringing a gravitas to the situation. And I do believe that it is a possibility. It's a possibility and we look forward to learning more from you. Thank you so much for being here, Paul, and thank you for sharing. <laughs>